Okay, welcome to the YouTube video run through of the weekly S&P 500 chart storm. This is the weekly thing that I do on Twitter, 10 charts and uh, sometimes having some strong conclusions and sometimes not. Sometimes just a collection of interesting charts. But the purpose of this video is to go through and explain what the chart is and why it's uh, worth paying some attention to. So we'll start it off with number one here, the Corona trades stabilizing, which is interesting. So uh, just uh, we'll blow this up, I'll show you. So the, the bottom two panels here, obviously the top one's S&P 500, not much to explain there. Jets versus Cure, so Jets is a global airlines ETF. Uh, obviously that is at the leading edge or the, you know, the front end of this whole um, pandemic. Cure is China Healthcare ETF, so you know, on the other side of that trade. And you can see there, um, you know, began trending down through January, f a bit more so in February, and then, you know, collapsed as the panic in markets took hold. Um, yeah, interesting little uh, kind of potential stabilization sign there. The other one that we've got here is called RCL, which is uh, forget the name, it, it's a cruise liner, um, you know, that's another one that's obviously uh, very um, prominently in the media about um, being, you know, hit by the, 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 the outbreak. SCI is a funeral home, so yeah, a little bit of a morbid take, but, you know, reality is reality. So yeah, that one is starting to sort of flatline as well, so you could argue that much of the bad news about the pandemic has kind of been priced in over this period um, and you know the fact that it is starting to stabilize on both fronts is quite interesting um, you know I think you know the contrarian in, in me definitely looks at these two things and thinks that there could be some opportunities here at some point um, you know of course we are fairly still still fairly early in the in the whole progression of the thing so um, I think, you know, it's interesting to keep an eye on these and, you know, if these start to turn then that could actually be a sign of things turning. But of course, you know, um, airliners, cruise liners, they're pretty much um, running on the minimum at the moment. So the next one, and kind of a similar line of inquiry here, credit is going to be a buy at some point. Um, the reason why I've said that is that I've been looking at a bunch of different indicators on credit, so valuation, sentiment, and those are already line, lighting up um, as they do, f you know, kind of early in it. Uh, once sentiment becomes perhaps a little bit more stretched or turns around, or once valuation starts to really uh, disproportionately account for the risks there, then yeah, that would be when it would be a definite buy versus a interesting but uh, back onto the tweet in the meantime there are some very re real sector specific stress points so if we look at these here these are five year senior uh, CDS so this is the oil and gas sector on the left there obviously oil has crashed and um, remains very low um, I don't think it has quite broken 20 yet but it's gotten fairly close and that's bad news for the oil and gas sector and you can see there CDS are blowing out um, quite powerfully and on the right there travel and leisure sector went from some of the lowest spreads on record to very not low and you know it's fairly clear and obvious to understand what's going on there. Same same thing actually for retail, but retail was actually trending up because retail had already had its own issues to begin with, and then this is just uh, putting straws on the camel's back for the retail sector. So there's you know there's definitely um, some sectors that are undergoing very real and um, you know significant stress at the moment. So that means um, and that's you know. It's the same thing, I guess, with equities. Valuations starting to look good, but you know there are some real issues going on. Um, we'll come back to equities at the end. Aside from the obvious sector-specific issues, industrials versus S&P 500 dropped below 08 levels, which you know 
obviously implies a broader economic shock. So going back to that previous one about the sector specific issues, there's also actually broader economic uh, headwinds for the rest of credit. So the, yeah, um, not much more to explain about that. That's uh, XLI industrial ETF versus SPY, which is of course the S&P, or the biggest S&P 100 ETF. And yeah, that's uh, looking fairly catastrophic. Next, as such, sentiment is now at extreme bearish levels. So we can see here, daily sentiment index. Um, yeah, it's uh, gone from quite significantly optimistic to, uh, as we said there, uh, extremely bearish. Which, you know, the when it gets to extreme bearish levels, odds of a rebound of, of some positive performance goes up. Number five, VIX curve indicator, so three month VXV versus spot VIX turned up after hitting panic levels, probably a good sign. So let's have a look at this. Yeah, uh, like many um, oscillators or sentiment indicators, um, the signal there is for it to go to an extreme low level and then actually turn it up. So you can see there, it got to a lowish level, kind of, uh, yeah, so it got to a low level back, you know, at the beginning of March, I think it is there. Yeah, so, and uh, that wasn't really the bottom, maybe there was a little bit of a um, pause. But, yeah, so the fact that it has actually turned up now is, I think, a positive sign. Of course, there are other things going on. So, you know, if, if there's other things out there that are going on that are going to speak louder than the signal from sentiment or oscillators, then of course they're quote unquote not going to work. But, you know, this is uh, another little piece of evidence to throw into the mix. Number six, um, actually kind of similar really. So the implied correlation index is also based on option pricing and also put together by the CBOE. Um, this one is actually ex displayed inverted, upside down. Um, so it's spiked, which means that the implied correlation spiked, um, actually also realized correlation spiked, so we'll just leap ahead to the next one. There we've got realized, rolling realized correlations, 12 months and one month. This is sector pairwise, so for example, the correlation between tech and financials, tech and industrials, blah, 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 blah. Um, and you can see there uh, everything has kind of converged to one. And uh, just to compare and contrast, I guess, um, so if you look at the top of the dot-com bubble, the pairwise sector correlation went very low, and that was because, you know, at that point, it was obviously tech and telecoms that were kind of leading everything. And, you know, at that point, actually, the, co the commodity sectors were not doing very good at all. So, you know, that was an example of a bubble that was led by a, you know, specific sector or set of sectors. And then, you know, 1997, 98, when there was a bunch of crises, obviously the Asian financial crisis and later LTCM and Russian debt crisis. But yeah, you can see whenever you get a crisis, uh, correlations tend to converge to one. And, um, you know, it, that's worth actually just dwelling on for a second. Um, you know, one of the core principles of asset allocation or portfolio construction is the idea of correlations and the um, concept that you can actually improve returns and lower risk um, by introducing anti-correlated or uncorrelated assets or lowly correlated assets, um, which is, you know, it's a, it's a sound concept, but I think you have to actually deploy a bit of uh, critical thinking when it comes to um, the actual practice of that because what you tend to find is this chart very clearly displays correlations are a dynamic construct not a static construct so if you looked at the average correlation across this period you might find that it's something like 0.6 and then in practice sometimes it's almost one and sometimes it's almost zero um, and, and, you know, we can actually look and think about what is going to drive correlations. Like if you analyze each specific asset or each specific part of a portfolio in isolation, 
you can actually think about what are the actual risk return drivers and you know are they actually quite similar for a different asset so is the outlook you know going to be for example negative for bonds and negative for equities in a case where you know um, the correlation would collapse or you know stop performing where you need it the most so it's um yeah, something to be mindful of and something to think about it's certainly uh, something that I have uh, paid more and more attention to um, as I've made that transition from thinking of correlations as a you know long-term average static input to a dynamic thing anyway let's look at this uh, implied correlation index and why would we actually look at it to begin with you can see there uh, higher correlations tend to emerge um, quite quickly and they tend to emerge around market bottoms and the reason for that is that market bottoms tend to emerge when people go into panic mode and when people go into panic mode they sell everything so therefore correlations go up and that's really the thinking behind this it's a kind of um, you know why this would work as a market timing indicator and you know if you're using it and expecting it to perform in the same way you'd expect there to be a bounce um, or perhaps a bottom fairly soon so in late 08 there was a spike in the implied correlation index which occurred just before or just um, you know coinciding with that little short-term bottom where there was a bit of a um, you know a material rally it wasn't the bottom but you know correlations actually did go back down afterwards which is sort of around where the true bottom was and you can see there there was a few other examples in history which I'll let you study on your own time moving on number eight S&P 500 200 day moving average bread all washed out really not much to add there um, honestly surprised that it's even 2% which um, is probably maybe some sort of utility or uh, gold stock or something that is uh, still managing to catch a little bit of safe haven bid or a bit of you know side effects from safe haven bid anyway ditto global equities so yes different indicator this is a proportion of countries whose year over year return for their main equity benchmark is positive basically zero so the rule for this indicator there's basically three rules one is well from the buying side I should add which I um, did talk about in the article there the link is there um, but anyway going back to this so the first rule is when it this indicator collapses you can see there when it collapsed um, in 94 I think that is marked a bit of a bottom there uh, looking for another one so in 2010 I think that is might be 2011 when it collapsed there that was another intermediate bottom but you can see there is a few other times where it collapsed and markets did not um, bottom they took a while to bottom after that so that brings us to the signal number two which is when it collapses and then actually turns up and so um, that will allow you to kind of get around the occasional but um, not uncommon instance of it being a false signal by only just buying when it um, collapses and then the third one is waiting for it to actually cross back above that blue line which is I think 60% so like many indicators such as this and many signals such as these um, you know buying on the collapse like when it falls down to let's say looks like 20% so if you buy as soon as it drops below 20% you will get false signals or you'll buy too early um, but you know you'll buy when when it does when it is the right signal you'll buy much earlier um, by contrast if you only wait until it goes below that 60% line and then actually crosses back above you miss a lot of the initial move um, you can see there you know you, you miss this initial move um, 08 you missed a lot of that initial move there um, but you know that what you get in exchange for missing that initial move is you get um, a lower probability of it being a false signal 
and that's kind of just um, a universal truth about these kind of indicators. Um, you know, you have to sacrifice accuracy versus um, overall return or missing the early part and uh, instead preferring to catch the belly of the move um, rather than the ends. So that's that. Number 10, last but certainly not least, this is probably one of my up there with one of my all-time favorite charts. Um, P10, price to trailing earnings, average trailing earnings of the last 10 years. Why would you do that? That would uh, give you kind of a normalized or cyclically adjusted view of earnings. And the point of that is to um, smooth out or eliminate some of the noisy wrong signals that you can get from looking at just trailing 12 or next 12 month earnings. And also it's quite useful in the current environment because earnings are going to almost certainly just get destroyed over the next um, months and quarters as the economies around the world basically shut down. But, you know, um, the well, one sort of underlying thesis or assumption there is that we do eventually get back to normal and therefore the last 10 years of average earnings should give us a rough approximation for what is normal. So if that all out of the road, let's interpret this. First of all, we've got US um, has become less expensive. Um, you wouldn't, I don't know if you'd actually necessarily call it cheap in absolute terms here. Um, it's certainly getting there. On an equity risk premium basis, it is definitely very cheap. Um, but not on this lens. Look at emerging markets back to 2003 levels. Developed markets, excluding US, is almost at a record low. So, you know, definitely um, probably more than pockets of value, but there's definitely value out there now. Um, this is kind of the um, situation where, you know, as I've mentioned in this article here, which I'll probably do a separate video on actually, but a general generational buying opportunity is emerging. Does that mean that it's here already? Um, well, I don't know because this is, you know, a very good point actually. You use this kind of indicator for making medium to longer term decisions. And the short term is basically anyone's guess. So, you know, there's the old adage that what is already cheap can get even cheaper. Um, and you know the 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 short term is anyone's guess. What I will say though is the more extreme the reading on these type of indicators, valuation indicators, the you know it, at that point it actually does start to have a little bit more uh, weighting on the short term. So you can see there when it reached the really extreme lows back then, um, you know basically that was a turning point. So yeah, very extremely valuable chart this, um, particularly when you see valuations at these kind of levels. So that's it. Um, yeah, again, um, I guess there's a kind of an emerging theme here. Some of these oscillators or sentiment indicators starting to look overbought, I mean oversold rather, oversold and sort of panicky, uh, odds of a rebound, very high, but yeah, there's some very real stuff going on in the background, very real impacts on credit, on equities, and um, yeah, as a result, valuations are looking good. So I'll leave it there until next week.